In federal court and 48 states, all it takes is one juror to prevent a guilty verdict at trial. Only two states do not abide by this rule. They are Oregon and Louisiana, which require a 10 to 2 jury verdict. Evangelisto Ramos was charged with second-degree murder in Louisiana. At trial, 10 jurors voted guilty and two not guilty. Consequently, Ramos was sentenced to life without the possibility of parole. On appeal, the state appellate court affirmed and the Louisiana Supreme Court denied review. The question before the Supreme Court in this case was whether the 14th Amendment incorporated to the states the Sixth Amendment's guarantee of a unanimous verdict. And the court said, yes, it does, incorporating the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial to the states while overturning their 1972 decision in Apodaca v. Oregon, holding that a unanimous verdict is indeed required to convict a defendant of a serious offense. About a year later, in Edwards v. Vannoy, the court clarified that the Ramos decision does not apply retroactively on federal collateral review. And now, the 2020 opinion of the court in Ramos v. Louisiana. Justice Gorsuch announced the judgment of the court and delivered the opinion of the court with respect to parts 1, 2A, 3, and 4B1, an opinion with respect to parts 2B, 4B2, and 5, in which Justice Ginsburg, Justice Breyer, and Justice Sotomayor join, and an opinion with respect to part 4A, in which Justice Ginsburg and Justice Breyer join. Accused of a serious crime, Evangelisto Ramos insisted on his innocence and invoked his right to a jury trial. Eventually, ten jurors found the evidence against him persuasive, but a pair of jurors believed that the state of Louisiana had failed to prove Mr. Ramos's guilt beyond reasonable doubt. They voted to acquit. In 48 states and federal court, a single juror's vote to acquit is enough to prevent a conviction, but not in Louisiana. Along with Oregon, Louisiana has long punished people based on 10 to 2 verdicts, like the one here. So instead of the mistrial he would have received almost anywhere else, Mr. Ramos was sentenced to life in prison without the possibility of parole. Why do Louisiana and Oregon allow non-unanimous convictions? Though it's hard to say why these laws persist, their origins are clear. Louisiana first endorsed non-unanimous verdicts for serious crimes at a constitutional convention in 1898. According to one committee chairman, the avowed purpose of that convention was to establish the supremacy of the white race, and the resulting document included many of the trappings of the Jim Crow era. A poll tax, a combined literacy and property ownership test, and a grandfather clause that in practice exempted white residents from the most onerous of these requirements. Nor was it only the prospect of African Americans voting that concerned the delegates. Just a week before the convention, the U.S. Senate passed on a resolution calling for an investigation into whether Louisiana was systemically excluding African Americans from juries. Seeking to avoid unwanted national attention, and aware that this court would strike down any policy of overt discrimination against African-American jurors as a violation of the 14th Amendment, 
the delegates sought to undermine African-American participation on juries in another way. With a careful eye on racial demographics, the convention delegates sculpted a facially race-neutral rule, permitting 10 to 2 verdicts in order to ensure that African-American juror service would be meaningless. Adopted in the 1930s, Oregon's rule permitting non-unanimous verdicts can be similarly traced to the rise of the Ku Klux Klan and efforts to dilute the influence of racial, ethnic, and religious minorities on Oregon juries. In fact, no one before us contests any of this. Courts in both Louisiana and Oregon have frankly acknowledged that race was a motivating factor in the adoption of their state's respective non-unanimity rules. We took this case to decide whether the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial, as incorporated against the states by way of the Fourteenth Amendment, requires a unanimous verdict to convict a defendant of a serious offense. Louisiana insists that this court has never definitively passed on the question and urges us to find its practice consistent with the Sixth Amendment. By contrast, the dissent doesn't try to defend Louisiana's law on Sixth or Fourteenth Amendment grounds. Tacitly, it seems to admit that the Constitution forbids states from using non-unanimous juries. Yet, unprompted by Louisiana, the dissent suggests our precedent requires us to rule for the state anyway. What explains all this? To answer the puzzle, it's necessary to say a bit more about the merits of the question presented, the relevant precedent, and, at last, the consequences that follow from saying what we know to be true. Part 1 The Sixth Amendment promises that in all criminal prosecutions, the accused shall enjoy the right to a speedy and public trial by an impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, which district shall have been previously ascertained by law. The amendment goes on to preserve other rights for criminal defendants, but says nothing else about what a trial by an impartial jury entails. Still, the promise of a jury trial surely meant something. Otherwise, there would have been no reason to write it down. Nor would it have made any sense to spell out the places from which jurors should be drawn if their powers as jurors could be freely abridged by statute. Imagine a constitution that allowed a jury trial to mean nothing but a single person rubber-stamping convictions without hearing any evidence, but simultaneously insisting that the lone juror come from a specific judicial district previously ascertained by law. And if that's not enough, imagine a constitution that included the same hollow guarantee, twice, not only in the Sixth Amendment, but also in Article Three. No, the text and structure of the Constitution clearly suggest that the term trial by an impartial jury carried with it some meaning about the content and requirements of a jury trial. One of these requirements was unanimity. Wherever we might look to determine what the term trial by an impartial jury trial meant at the time of the Sixth Amendment's adoption, whether it's the common law, state practices in the founding era, or opinions and treatises written soon afterwards, the answer is unmistakable. A jury must reach a unanimous verdict 
in order to convict. The requirement of juror unanimity emerged in 14th century England and was soon accepted as a vital right protected by the common law. As Blackstone explained, no person could be found guilty of a serious crime unless the truth of every accusation should be confirmed by the unanimous suffrage of twelve of his equals and neighbors, indifferently chosen and superior to all suspicion. A verdict taken from eleven was no verdict at all. This same rule applied in the young American states. Six state constitutions explicitly required unanimity. Another four preserved the right to a jury trial in more general terms. But the variations did not matter much. Consistent with the common law, state courts appeared to regard unanimity as an essential feature of the jury trial. If the term trial by an impartial jury carried any meaning at all, it surely included a requirement as long and widely accepted as unanimity. Influential post-adoption treatises confirm this understanding. For example, in 1824, Nathan Dane reported as fact that the U.S. Constitution required unanimity in criminal jury trials for serious offenses. A few years later, Justice Story explained in his Commentaries on the Constitution that in common cases, the law not only presumes every man innocent until he is proved guilty, but unanimity in the verdict of the jury is indispensable. Similar statements can be found in American legal treatises throughout the 19th century. Nor is this a case where the original public meaning was lost to time and only recently recovered. This court has repeatedly, and over many years, recognized that the Sixth Amendment requires unanimity. As early as 1898, the court said, that a defendant enjoys a constitutional right to demand that his liberty should not be taken from him except by the joint action of the court and the unanimous verdict of a jury of twelve persons. A few decades later, the court elaborated that the Sixth Amendment affords a right to a trial by jury as understood and applied at common law including all the essential elements as they were recognized in this country and England when the Constitution was adopted. And, the court observed, this includes a requirement that the verdict should be unanimous. In all, this court has commented on the Sixth Amendment's unanimity requirement no fewer than 13 times over more than 120 years. There can be no question either that the Sixth Amendment's unanimity requirement applies to state and federal criminal trials equally. This court has long explained that the Sixth Amendment right to a jury trial is fundamental to the American scheme of justice and incorporated against the states under the Fourteenth Amendment. This court has long explained, too, that incorporated provisions of the Bill of Rights bear the same content when asserted against states as they do when asserted against the federal government. So if the Sixth Amendment's right to a jury trial requires a unanimous verdict to support a conviction in federal court, it requires no less in state court. Part 2. Section A. How, despite these seemingly straightforward principles, have Louisiana and Oregon's laws imagined to hang on for so long? It turns out that the Sixth Amendment's otherwise simple story 
took a strange turn in 1972. That year, the court confronted these states' unconventional schemes for the first time in Apodaca v. Oregon and a companion case, Johnson v. Louisiana. Ultimately, the court could do no more than issue a badly fractured set of opinions. Four dissenting justices would not have hesitated to strike down the state's laws, recognizing that the Sixth Amendment requires unanimity and that this guarantee is fully applicable against the states under the Fourteenth Amendment. But a four-justice plurality took a very different view of the Sixth Amendment. These justices declared that the real question before them was whether unanimity serves an important function in contemporary society. Then, having reframed the question, the plurality wasted few words before concluding that unanimity's costs outweigh its benefits in the modern era, so the Sixth Amendment should not stand in the way of Louisiana or Oregon. The ninth member of the court adopted a position that was neither here nor there. On the one hand, Justice Powell agreed that as a matter of history and precedent, the Sixth Amendment requires a unanimous jury verdict to convict. But on the other hand, he argued that the Fourteenth Amendment does not render this guarantee against the federal government fully applicable against the states. In this way, Justice Powell doubled down on his belief in dual-track incorporation, the idea that a single right can mean two different things depending on whether it is being invoked against the federal or a state government. Justice Powell acknowledged that his argument for dual-track incorporation came late in the day. Late it was. The court had already, nearly a decade earlier, rejected the notion that the 14th Amendment applies to the state's only a watered-down subjective version of the individual guarantees of the Bill of Rights. It's a point we've restated many times since, too, including as recently as last year. Still, Justice Powell frankly explained he was unwilling to follow the court's precedents, so he offered up the essential fifth vote to uphold Mr. Apodaca's conviction, if based only on a view of the 14th Amendment that he knew was, and remains, foreclosed by precedent. Section B. In the years following Apodaca, both Louisiana and Oregon chose to continue allowing non-unanimous verdicts, but their practices have always stood on shaky ground. After all, while Justice Powell's vote secured a favorable judgment for the states in Apodaca, it's never been clear what rationale could support a similar result in future cases. Only two possibilities exist. Either the Sixth Amendment allows non-unanimous verdicts, or the Sixth Amendment's guarantee of a jury trial applies with less force to the states under the Fourteenth Amendment. Yet, as we've seen, both bear their problems. In Apodaca itself, a majority of justices, including Justice Powell, recognized that the Sixth Amendment demands unanimity, just as our cases have long said. And this court's precedents, both then and now, prevent the court from applying the Sixth Amendment to the states in some mutated and diminished form under the Fourteenth Amendment. So what could we possibly describe as the holding of Apodaca? Really, no one has found a way to make sense of it. In later cases, 
This court has labeled Apodaca an exception, unusual, and in any event, not an endorsement of Justice Powell's view of incorporation. At the same time, we have continued to recognize the historical need for unanimity. We've been studiously ambiguous, even inconsistent, about what Apodaca might mean. To its credit, Louisiana acknowledges the problem. The state expressly tells us it is not asking the court to accord Justice Powell's solo opinion in Apodaca, presidential force. Instead, in an effort to win today's case, Louisiana embraces the idea that everything is up for grabs. It contends that this court has never definitively ruled on the propriety of non-unanimous juries under the Sixth Amendment and that we should use this case to hold for the first time that non-unanimous juries are permissible in state and federal courts alike. Part 3 Louisiana's approach may not be quite as tough as trying to defend Justice Powell's dual-track theory of incorporation, but it's pretty close. How does the state deal with the fact that this court has said 13 times over 120 years that the Sixth Amendment does require unanimity, or the fact that five justices in Apodaca said the same? The best the state can offer is to suggest that all these statements came in dicta. But even supposing, without granting, that Louisiana is right and it's dicta all the way down, why would the court now walk away from many of its own statements about the Constitution's meaning? And what about the prior 400 years of English and American cases requiring unanimity? Should we dismiss all those as dicta too? Sensibly, Louisiana doesn't dispute that the common law required unanimity. Instead, it argues that the drafting history of the Sixth Amendment reveals an intent by the framers to leave this particular feature behind. The state points to the fact that Madison's proposal for the Sixth Amendment originally read, The trial of all crimes shall be by an impartial jury of freeholders of the vicinage, with the requisite of unanimity for conviction, of the right of challenge, and other accustomed requisites. Louisiana notes that the House of Representatives approved this text with minor modifications, yet the state stresses the Senate replaced impartial jury of freeholders of the vicinage with impartial jury of the state and district wherein the crime shall have been committed, and also removed the explicit references to unanimity, the right of challenge, and other accustomed requisites. In light of these revisions, Louisiana would have us infer an intent to abandon the common law's traditional unanimity requirement. But this snippet of drafting history could just as easily support the opposite inference. Maybe the Senate deleted the language about unanimity, the right of challenge, and other accustomed prerequisites, because all of this was so plainly included in the promise of a trial by an impartial jury that senators considered the language surplusage. The truth is that we have little contemporaneous evidence shedding light on why the Senate acted as it did. So rather than dwelling on text left on the cutting room floor, we are much better served by interpreting the language Congress retained and the states ratified. And, as we've seen, at the time of the amendment's adoption, the right to a jury trial meant a trial in which the jury renders 
a unanimous verdict, further undermining Louisiana's inference about the drafting history is the fact that it proves too much. If the Senate's deletion of the word unanimity changed the meaning of the text that remains, then the same would seemingly have to follow for the other deleted words as well. So it's not just unanimity that died in the Senate, but all the other accustomed requisites associated with the common law jury trial right, i.e. everything history might have taught us about what it means to have a jury trial. Taking the state's argument from drafting history to its logical conclusion would thus leave the right to a trial by jury devoid of meaning. A right mentioned twice in the Constitution would be reduced to an empty promise. That can't be right. Faced with this hard fact, Louisiana's only remaining option is to invite us to distinguish between the historic features of common law jury trials that we think serve important enough functions to migrate silently into the Sixth Amendment and those that don't. And on the state's account, we should conclude that unanimity isn't worthy enough to make the trip. But to see the dangers of Louisiana's overwise approach, there's no need to look any further than Apodaca itself. There, four justices pursuing the functionalist approach Louisiana espouses began by describing the essential benefit of a jury trial as the interposition of the common sense judgment of a group of laymen between the defendant and the possibility of an overzealous prosecutor. And measured against that muddy yardstick, they quickly concluded that requiring 12 rather than 10 votes to convict offers no meaningful improvement. Meanwhile, these justices argued, states have good and important reasons for dispensing with unanimity such as seeking to reduce the rate of hung juries. Who can profess confidence in a breezy cost-benefit analysis like that? Lost in the accounting are the racially discriminatory reasons that Louisiana and Oregon adopted their particular rules in the first place. What's more, the plurality never explained why the promised benefit of abandoning unanimity, reducing the rate of hung juries, always scores as a credit, not a cost. But who can say whether any particular hung jury is a waste, rather than an example of a jury doing exactly what the plurality said it should, deliberating carefully and safeguarding against overzealous prosecutions? And what about the fact, too, that some studies suggest that the elimination of unanimity has only a small effect on the rate of hung juries, or the fact that others profess to have found that requiring unanimity may provide other possible benefits, including more open-minded and more thorough deliberations? It seems the Apodaca plurality never even conceived of such possibilities. Our real objection here isn't that the Apodaca plurality's cost-benefit analysis was too skimpy. The deeper problem is that the plurality subjected the ancient guarantee of a unanimous jury verdict to its own functionalist assessment in the first place and Louisiana asks us to repeat the error today, just replacing Apodaca's functionalist assessment with our own updated version. All this overlooks the fact that at the time of the Sixth Amendment's adoption, the right to trial by jury 
included a right to a unanimous verdict. When the American people chose to enshrine that right in the Constitution, they weren't suggesting fruitful topics for future cost-benefit analyses. They were seeking to ensure that their children's children would enjoy the same hard-won liberty they enjoyed. As judges, it is not our role to reassess whether the right to a unanimous jury is important enough to retain. With humility, we must accept that this right may serve purposes evading our current notice. We are entrusted to preserve and protect that liberty, not balance it away aided by no more than social statistics. We've come to the end of part one of this opinion, but don't worry, the next episode will pick up right where we left off. Until then, thanks for listening to What SCOTUS Wrote Us.